Um, so yeah, now I want to talk a little bit more about um, what I'm doing next, which is is quite exploratory and, and research oriented as well as creation oriented um, and completely new territory for me. Uh, and it's uh, smell or scent or olfaction, many different words for it. Um, I've been over the last few years becoming more and more interested in it, um, how scent could be used interactively. I'm interested in all of the different sensory interfaces that, especially the ones that we don't really know how to use very well, to try to tease out what can be done with them and how, um, what are the challenges of them, and to not be afraid of that, but to kind of find ways to jump in and explore that. Um, so I think a lot of the stuff that we think we know about about these senses is like just plain wrong. There's new insights in in this uh, sensory field, uh, scientific insights like every year. Like for instance, uh, a pair of scientists won a Nobel Prize for uh, discovering the olfactory receptors, and uh, it kind of blew my mind to find out that they only did that in 2004. Like it's been less than 10 years that we even knew how we smelled. Like until then we didn't quite have a, have a complete picture of, of what happened. So now we understand what's going on a lot better biologically and neurologically. And I think since then, especially the field has been quite exploding. Um, our technologies for biochemistry are improving and becoming cheaper. And I'm sure you're all aware that's led to the rise in bio art. And this is kind of part of that. Um, and I think there's also a general increase in interest and understanding of the human microbial symbiotic relationship, um, which is pretty undeniable at this point. And I think we're a little less afraid of, of germs now and, and realize that we're like, what, something like 90% made out of microbes or something. Um, and, but the important part for me is, for that is, of course, that, that um, bacteria is uh, one of the main reasons why we have smells that that humans and other animals and all kinds of organic stuff actually smells is from the bacteria hey are you checking <laughs> um breaking down uh breaking down proteins and and off-gassing all kinds of of other chemicals that that stink um so uh yeah so what are some of the challenges um, well, of course, it's a uh, it's a chemical medium uh, smell. It's it's so it's hard harder to work with creatively, and it's especially hard to work with uh, digitally. Um, it's uh, organic chemistry. It's it's you have to have actual physical chemical substances as your resources, um, and you have to be have special laboratories to analyze them. You have to have things like gas chromatographs and mass spectrometers. Um, the materials themselves might have safety issues, not only with like their base components, but simply from the physiological effects of scent. I have some molecules here on the screen and, and you see the, the nice ones that have been isolated, like the ones that smell like bananas and pears and cherries. Well, do you know what those other two are on the screen? Probably not. <laughs> That's putrescine and cadaverine. Um, which live up to their names. I haven't ever smelled them, and I sometimes I would like to, but I'm also terrified too because, you know, we can have um, humans can have uh, immediate violent physical reactions when they when they smell these particular chemicals. So there is a danger in doing things with smell. Smell stinks sometimes, which is also fun. Um, yeah. So uh, um, biochemically. We have to think of the uh, uh, the smells and how they're how they're interacting with our physiology. Um, humans have been we've discovered that we have about can we can smell about 350 50 different molecules, um, but each person individual person may not smell the same like 330 to 380. They think it's in that range. Um, it's determined by genetics, so it may be that that one smell. Uh, people have specific anosmias where one person can smell that smell and another person just absolutely can't. It's like it doesn't exist for them. There's also just differences in um, perception of certain smells. On the screen is cilantro, which is notorious because some people love it and some people can't stand it. They say it tastes like soap, and um, it's not just them being picky. For them, like it really does taste like soap. Actually, I'm kind of curious, like who here like likes cilantro? 
Okay, that's a few. Is there any who here really hates cilantro? Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, well, it's it's a, a, a smaller proportion, but it's definitely you know statistically significant. So, like, if you're designing something that smells, you have to take into consideration the fact that there's this huge variation between individuals. It's a little bit like color blindness, you know. Um, some people just won't be able to smell it, or they'll be really nauseated by something that you would have otherwise thought smelled just fine. Um, and it's also cultural um, to one group of people that have grown up in one part of the world with one type of food. A certain smell might be comforting or delicious, but then to another group of people, that same smell would be like alien, unfamiliar, potentially even quite disgusting. So you have to realize that it, your work might not be cross-culturally relevant. Um, so, so smell, of course, involves actual particles from actual things floating around in the air and going into your nose and touching you. And um, some people have uh, really violent adverse reactions to, to chemicals. They're extra sensitive to them. Sometimes it's purely physiological. Sometimes it's somewhat psychological, like it's from an association they have with, with that smell in the past. Um, well, for whatever the reason, it's definitely real and uh, that, you know, to the point that some places, say schools um, and offices and things, are becoming designated fragrance-free because other people are so troubled by, by the presence of perfumes and strong smells that they can't function in those environments. So I think, I mean, that shouldn't prevent us from making work that, that engages with the sense of smell, but it's... I. I I like to compare it maybe to, you know, how there's certain media art installations and outside there's that that inevitable sign like like if you're prone to seizures, do not go in here. It's got strobing lights and and so there may be some requirement they or just a sort of self-imposed uh, idea to um, warn people before they come into the uh, place where the work is happening or exists that that if they are smell sensitive that they probably don't want to go there and, and unfortunately don't want to experience that. I had a really hard time finding a slide to <laughs> demonstrate some of the, the qualities of smell about it being possible to contain inside of a space invisibly but kind of imperfectly because it, it can escape. You can There's nothing you can do to prevent the, the smell from entirely escaping except completely enclose the things so that you can't interact with it either. Um, and it has other uh, qualities like it's the rate of dissipation. It might take a long time once the smell is there uh, in a space to go away. Um, the dispersal and the, and the movement of the smell is going to be affected by so many different environmental factors like the temperature of the space or the thing, the, the humidity there, um, and even the air currents. Um, so like in perfume, the, the current of air that, that the perfume is sort of traveling on when you walk by is called the sillage. Um, but there's, uh, you know, there's also people that, that uh, have devoted their careers to trying to figure out where smells, bad smells are going to go when you have a factory in town. Where's the wind going to blow the bad smell down the valley? You know? So all these things are, um, the smell isn't really containable, but it's really hard to direct it to. Um, and it smell it, it travels really slowly compared to sight and sound. So um, that might make it really hard if you want to have something that has a smell and um, image or a moving image or music or something to actually coordinate the timing of it. That, that uh, was one of the main problems in the early days of, of uh, cinema that like smellorama or things like that was like getting the smell in at the right time and out at the right time and not sticking around because smells can be absorbed into things and they, they linger long beyond the, the time that you want them to be there. Anyone with a refrigerator knows what I'm talking about. Um, and so ideally, all these things need to be taken into consideration. You have to think about like what not only the thing that's creating the smell, but the entire design of the environment that it's going to be in, whether it's an absorbent or you know if you can hose down the walls or whatever. Um, and different ways of distributing smells. You, there's a lot of them. Um, that's partly what my next phase of research will be is to try to figure out how to make some of these different methods um, like uh, either 
in the air or in a small enclosed device or directly through a tube into someone's nose or is it simply on a surface or is it on a surface like a scratch and sniff that you have to um, you know break some sort of tiny capsules tiny bubbles of, of uh, material or is it even using like actual organic materials um, because that can give you a really much better quality of smell but then you know you have pine chips and you can't really turn off pine chips or you know dead fish or something so all those things need to be considered in the in the possibilities but also the the limitations of working with smell some of the other things um we 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 experience smell more intensely in proximity to its source of course um that's our um basic lived experience so if you are um using smell that gives an illusion of proximity so you can use that to your advantage if you want people to feel like they're close to something um, even if they have their eyes closed if they're I don't know in a VR or something you can make the smell stronger when they go closer to it in say a virtual environment um, so you can you can use that and then have it at a weaker uh, concentration when you're further away from it um, Technically, uh, I, I at least wanted to, to, to look at or show you some of the, the things that people have tried to do to do a kind of remote, like long distance smell broadcasting thing, which seems to come up in, in uh, decade long cycles or something. The, the first wave was, was in the late 90s, I guess, so it's been more than a decade. The one on the left looks kind of like a weird shark thing. Uh, it was the Digisense eye smell that uh, came out in the late 90s. Um, but when I say came out, I mean it was, it was you know, showing it at CES and, and, and it was getting hyped a lot. Um, I don't, it didn't really make it to market. Um, the ones that are on the right of it uh, that are more rectangular are the ones that are in development now and uh, are hoping to be released soon or are maybe in use in very limited um, contexts. One of the big ones, I mean, they, they try to promote this as something that you'd want to use for gaming, like you're playing the uh, racing game and you can smell the burning rubber or, or things like that. But the real, um, the practical use that has taken hold the most is things like uh, treating post-traumatic stress disorder by having environments that have a little bit added element of realism, even if they're a VR or a, a you know, game-like environment, you can add some smells uh, that that help, well, help people relive the experience and hopefully be able to work through them. And then uh, I think one of the very interesting developments, although you can't really tell because it's a little, well, you can see it pretty well. It's very white on white. Um, the one on the bottom is a, uh, a DIY open sourced um, scent making uh, distributing device that you can build yourself and put in any scent you want called the Ollie. Um, it's made by Mint Digital and um, they have a website where you can download the plans and, and make one yourself. But the idea with the most of these, the commercial ones, is that you'd have like multiple scents that you could trigger somehow. But then there's the, of course, the, I the problem of, well, what sense are there is it like cartridges that you have to put in when you're playing a certain genre or like how can you have enough sense that match the kind of content you want and from my perspective it's like well I want one that's only like it's shipping with my product or my game or my whatever because it, it has smells in it that no one else is really going to care about um, it's not going to use the most generic ones it's going to have something that's like super unique so so I'm not really trying to go down the route of these different technologies. I'm more working with the base materials to try to figure out a way to distribute things like in a um, installation environment or something like that because I don't want to stick to the burning rubber or whatever, even if that stuff did exist, which it kind of doesn't. Um, so what are some of the, these are all the problems, these are all the challenges, and uh, what are some of the reasons why you'd even want to use scent other than then the motivation that nobody's really done it much before. Um, 10 minutes? Okay, no prob. Um, and so I wanted to at least talk about what some of the, the powers are that Scent has and why we'd want to use it. You can't have a presentation about Scent uh, without showing some Madeleines because that's like the, the iconic 
um, thing. It's uh, from a book by Marcel Proust called Swan's Way, which was the first of the remembrance of things past. And it's, I mean, from the name of the book, you can tell it's all about him remembering things that happened to him. And the very first thing that happens is he talks about um, having a, a Madeline, which are these little sponge cookies dipped in tea. And it suddenly like sends him back to, to the past and he starts remembering all these details and tell, writing an, an entire gigantic series of multiple novels based on on having this trigger. Um, so um, smell is, uh, memory is all, uh, so often associated with the, uh, the power of smell and it, it's definitely true that it can call up very significant, uh, um, not significant, but um, very particular things that you may not have remembered and then that you haven't smelled that smell in a long time. So when you do smell it, it really um, is a very sudden thing. It just goes, uh, it's the, I'm going to get the science wrong here, but the, um, so there's the nerves that are inside of our nose and they go basically um, directly to your brain and they don't, they go directly to certain parts of your brain and don't have to pass through other parts and are therefore just, I'm, I'm getting it quite wrong and I will refer you at the end to a few books that have a little bit more of the scientific detail about it. But in essence, the um, smell and your sense of memory are very closely in, entwined. What else do we use smell for? Uh, well, of course, it protects our health. Um, if you uh, smell some smoke, burnt something burning, or if you smell rotten food, or it's really a kind of warning system that, that lets you know if something's not right. And uh, so you could, of course, be able to use that somehow to give a sense of unease in a, in a creation that you are making. Um, but of course, on the flip side, you could also make something that is uh, a pleasant smell and that uh, that gave the opposite impression. But... but uh, developmentally as you human or as uh, mammals or whatever creatures go, um, the warning sense is the one that's more basic. You can also maybe trigger some, some instincts. Um, of course, you, the, it's, you know, we normally think of animals and their musks and, and the pheromones and, and things like that. Um, and uh, a lot of that is hype, of course, as it relates to humans, but um, it's not all hype, and um, there are certain smells that relate to different uh, uh, chemical reactions in our body that were triggered by emotional states. One that's uh, been pretty well researched is that there is a kind of smell of fear um, based on the uh, proteins that your body um, releases in your sweat, and then that gets broken down by the bacteria, and that's what creates the smell. And they've actually researched this kind of smell of fear and um, realized that it was catching. Like you could be exposed to this this um, particular scent, which is not very strong, or you wouldn't be able to identify it too easily um, consciously. But people that were um, exposed to the smell of fear that had come off of other people when they were watching something frightening were actually then physiologically having a, a fear reaction, even though there was nothing triggering them they were the, the second group of people were not seeing anything scary they were just smelling this thing from people who had been scared and it created that so it, there's definitely something to there to that not entirely conscious um, but it's there and one of the um, smell artists who's perhaps most known or is quite active uh, her name's Cicel Tolis and uh, she actually um, isolated this smell of fear, and she says she likes to like wear it as a cologne when she goes to parties. So, um, so much like the the Madeleine, um, you can create and invoke associations. Um, this is a um, from the film Ratatouille. If you've ever seen it, the the um, the very uh, food critic who gets like whisked away to his, his childhood very suddenly by, by tasting something that was made for him in this restaurant. Um, and of course, taste. I haven't talked too much about taste as a separate thing, but, but except for the few different flavors that we have all isolated in our tongue, like the sweet and the sour and the bitter and all that, everything else about taste, what we call taste, is actually smell, so, so aroma. It's all smell that you smell through a different part of your, not through the not, not only through the front of your nose, but also the part in the back of your palate that goes through the, to the same um, sensory system. Um, 
And I think the interesting thing for creating work is that uh, you can create new associations. You don't only rely on associations that people have in their past, because how can you really know what everyone has in their past? But in a work, you could put smells in it that you would then later on be able to use and invoke to bring back memories of things that had happened to them earlier in the experience. Um, OK, identification and recognition. Um, of course, dogs are notorious for this, and but humans do it too, a little less conspicuously. We have that power. Um, there was an uh, interesting an anecdote in one of uh, the books I read that there was a laboratory test where people were asked to smell a selection of dog beds. They were all dog owners, and they were asked to smell these um, different pet beds, dog beds, and to try to identify the one that their dog had slept in previously and only do it by smell, so they can't like see the bed or see any fur on it or anything like that. And uh, it was pretty amazing that they, the dog owners were able to choose the, the right dog bed 89% of the time. So yeah, we humans have a really good sense of smell. I think we, we don't give ourselves enough credit. A lot of it is uh, more in the, the brain and its capacity, not in the, the nose. Um, I'm gonna go pretty fast through these since I'm getting close to the end. Um, so the smell could very strongly uh, evoke a sense of place or of time, of you know what's around you. Um, maybe for time, you could tell if you're in the past, if the kind of fuel that was being used was like wood fire or coal or, or things like that, you know, things that we don't smell as often anymore. Um, you could use smell to support a narrative. If there's something going on uh, in a story that is related very clearly to uh, something that would smell in real life, you can use that to, to uh, evoke a sense of place or the, the plot. Um, something that could be interesting is like supporting subconscious or unstated themes in a work because sen smells can be sensed at a very low level, almost below a conscious level, that could give certain emotions without you quite being able to identify what the smell was. And perhaps we could use this to evoke illusions and emotions in, in our work. And perhaps <laughs> everyone's favorite, a character. You could use smell to identify or associate with a character. Um, of course, the other example might be you can smell the perfume of some, uh, you know, in a noir mystery or something. But I think, you know, smelling a zombie might be a little more challenging or interesting. Um, sm I'm almost done. <laughs> so smell uh, contributes to our sense of the materiality of things. So what things are made out of. And they give us more of a sense that things around us are real because... Uh, the one like one of the major things that a digital medium is lacking is that that actual material and the smell and of course touch also but but um, will give you that um, more visceral sense of okay I'm really near this thing it really exists and um, uh, it could make things feel a lot more uh, realistic for that reason or you know evoke a sense of of surreal surreality even. Um, okay, so this is the project I'm about to uh, continue on now um, at the, um, in the next couple of months at a uh, residency um, at the group Blast Theory in, in Brighton, if you've heard of it. Um, it's uh, a continuation of the project I did in Vienna called uh, the Sugar Project, although this particular part of it is called the Olfactorizer. It's a smell delivery device that has a a selection, a custom selection of smells. Originally, w it was uh, analyzing whether I was being productive or not in my programming uh, lessons, um, and then adapted later for the game I made in the end, whether you were doing a successful job in the game. And as you might recall, I said, you're a horse and you're doing this performance. So uh, there's uh, the capability of three smells in this version of the, the uh, olfactorizer. And uh, they are like really nice meadow grass if you're doing great, and like a uh, leather and um, hay smell if you are kind of just average. And if you were not doing well um, and your horse was dropping some horse apples, um, it gave off a smell that I um, custom designed by going out in the streets of Vienna and picking up, well, a friend picked up some horse 
horse turds. And um, then I made my own kind of smell essence, essence eau de stable or something. Um, and that was uh, on the left there is a couple of um, the experiments that I was running to see whether it was better to try to get the smell in an oil, mineral oil solution or in an alcohol solution. And it turned out the oil was better for the smell, but it wasn't as nice and green. <laughs> um, so the project I'll be doing next is kind of taking this, this kind of this work to the next uh, steps, I guess. Um, I'll be creating a, a, another interactive smell sculpture that um, is going to use the input it will use will be more uh, physical. So something like um, the leap or a combination of leap and connect to have a more um, uh, have it have it have more uh, awareness of its environment and it would be like something like a small creature so if you get near it it might uh, be afraid of you and if you're nice maybe it's giving off the, the smell that it's happy and if you're uh, maybe too abruptly approaching it or frightening it it could give off some kind of other smell um, and uh, so that's where I am with that now. I haven't decided what the smells will be, but I've, I've got some ideas going on. And so this is, uh, this is the end. Um, here's some more resources if you want to look up some of the actual science or at least entertaining um, information behind the things that I've talked about. Um, there's a writer, Avery Gilbert, who has written some really good books and has a really funny blog. And um, also... Um, a scholar named Simon Niedenthal in Sweden, who actually just like a month ago published what I think might be the very first uh, um, academic paper on smell in games. And so it was perfect timing for me. I um, it was uh, really w wonderful that there's a few other people working in the same space. So I encourage you, if you're interested in any of this, to check out those. And if you want to get in touch with me, then that's my information there. Thanks.